Congress and the future of politics in the 21st century, which basically means it could be about anything. Uh, the Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture is made uh, possible by a gift from the Keen and Charitable Trust. And we bring in distinguished um, uh, people from the highest sort of professional uh, careers. We've had people like uh, General McChrystal, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, folks of this caliber. And so it's entirely appropriate that tonight we have our state senator, uh, Senator Burr, with us tonight. Uh, he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1994 and served uh, five terms there. And when he was there, he was the vice chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And now he's in the Senate. Uh, he's chairman of the US Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and also a member of the Senate Committee on Finance, the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, as well as the Senate Special Committee on Aging. And we were just having a little chat before we came in here to join you. And uh, as a university, we are very grateful to Senator Burr because he has been uh, very principled in standing up uh, for funding for the National Institutes of Health in particular and helping uh, Congress um, continually pass support for research funding for universities such as ours. So we're very grateful for that, Senator Burr. Uh, Senator Burr was born in Char Charlottesville, I just learned, uh, but gr moved as a child to Winston-Salem. It's a good thing, because Virginia's the only one left in the tournament. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, I was rooting for you. <laughs> He's a graduate of Wake Forest uh, University, and uh, there he played football, right? Is that right? And, uh, and he had a, uh, graduated with a degree in communications. And his wife, Brooke, is also with us tonight. Welcome, Brooke. Glad you could join us. So uh, with uh, Senator Byrne on stage is Deandra Rose. He's an assistant professor here at the Sanford School of Public Policy. Uh, and uh, Deandra Rose ha has recently written, written a book called Citizens by Degree, which is about the integration of gender uh, into higher education. And she's a specialist in political behavior and politics. And she'll be interviewing the senator tonight. And after their conversation is done, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. We'll have a couple of mic runners. If you do want to ask a question, just raise your hand, and then we'll come to you. You don't have to queue anywhere in particular. With that, and without further ado, welcome, Senator Burr. Welcome, Deandra Rose. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dean Kelly. And Senator Burr, it's such an honor to get the chance to talk to you tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Listen to that introduction. I think this is going to be more a therapy session. You know? <laughs> We're going to have a good time. I think it's going to be fun. OK, so you know, it's especially exciting for us to have you here because you're the very first North Carolina senator to deliver the Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture. And you also hold the Senate seat that Terry Sanford once sat in. And so I have to ask, did you ever cross paths with Terry Sanford? Well, Terry and I ran into each other. Of course, I was a bit younger. And um, his, his life in Washington was over by that time. Um, but, you know, Terry was a very interesting fellow. I mean, uh, 16 years of president here a Chapel Hill graduate. I'm not sure how the hell that happens. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think you could let somebody do that. Um, governor, senator, veteran. Um, I'm not sure that anybody's lived as full a life as Terry Sanford did. So um, as far as I'm concerned, he's a foundational figure for the state and, and uh, appropriate to see this, this building named after him. So I'm going to jump right into the thing that I think everyone wants to know about. Since 2015, you've served as the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I'm sure that um, everyone here would join me in wanting to hear about your perspectives on recent events related to the investigation of Russian interference into the 2016 presidential election. So is it correct that the Mueller report and your own committee's investigations established two things. So one, that Russia interfered in our election, 
in an effort to get President Trump elected, and two, that there's not much evidence that the Trump campaign coordinated with the Russian government to maximize or to um, maximize their efforts. Yeah, I think I think the answer to both of them is is yes. Uh, Russia extensively played in 2016, not necessarily in the election. What Russia did was they tried to create societal chaos running up to an election. Now, I think people are going to be shocked when they see the specifics. Russia used less than $100,000 to attack the American society. And I said it when we finished the, the Russia piece that dealt with social media, that the, the thing that we need to get through the media skulls and to the American people is this really wasn't about an election. This was about a 1960s Soviet mentality that if it's bad for America, it's good for them. And they used 21st century tools to do it. And they used our own First Amendment protection to hide behind. So it's, it's challenging now to have an assessment that Russia did all this. And uh, they manipulated Facebook and Twitter and Google and YouTube and I can go through the litany of them. And it really wasn't until we sat down and showed Facebook and Twitter specifically what had happened that they realized they've got to be a good corporate partner too. And when we went into 2018, they collaborated with the federal government. We had a totally different scenario. It wasn't identifying after the fact what the Russians had, did, had done. It was proactively Facebook and Twitter going out and taking pages down, getting rid of pages that had uh, uh, fake personas, mm -hmm. beginning to understand the use of bots and how bots could drive a story to make it look like 100,000 people had read a story when not one person in the world had read a story, yet the media felt compelled then to write the story, mm -hmm. which meant that they were writing about something that didn't even happen or exist. And, and so this is, a, this is a real challenge for us as a country because I can't legislate necessarily against what Russia did. Mm -hmm. I've got to hope that we can collaboratively, collaboratively work with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google in hopes that they can police it because if not, this gets challenged on a First Amendment issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the second piece that you talked about... Um, about the collusion... Collusion, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me preface it by saying we're not finished with our investigation. We've interviewed over 200 people. We've got over 40,000 pages of interview notes. We've reviewed over 400,000 documents. We've interviewed individuals on three different continents. Uh, we have looked more exhaustively than I think the special counsel at those things dealing with the Trump campaign and Russia, specifically because ours is a counterintelligence mandate. It is not a criminal mandate. We, Congress has no jurisdiction over criminal issues. Where we have sensed a degree of criminality, we have made that referral either to the special counsel, to the Southern District of New York, or to the DC prosecutor. And we have been very aggressive at who we have referred. Today, the committee has no evidence of any collusion between the Trump campaign and any individual or the Russian government. Mm -hmm. I think that's consistent with what uh, Special Counsel Mueller came out with, though I haven't read his report. So I, 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 I hold off uh, sort of certifying this across the board until I read the report. But knowing what I know today, I can sort of understand why they came to that conclusion, because I think in most cases, we looked at that piece more extensively than the special prosecutor looked at it. Hmm. And do you have the sense that we are doing enough to punish Russia for what they did? Listen, the special counsel uh, indicted uh, two Russian companies. They've, uh, s they've indicted and or sanctioned a lot of... Uh, two or three oligarchs so far. Um, there are other indictments that are, that are pending. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is, 
how do you serve an indictment on somebody that is in Russia? Hmm. Now, the best we've done is take a host of people and we've limited their ability to, to transit anywhere in the world. As soon as they leave Russia, if they land in a place that has an extradition treaty with the United States, we might be able to access that individual. But what we have done is we've changed the travel habits of a number of Russian oligarchs and a number of individual companies. Mm -hmm. And I guess more broadly, what are we doing to make sure that this doesn't happen again in 2020? For 2018, we, we, we collaborated very closely with uh, Facebook and Twitter specifically. And we saw great promise and results out of that collaboration. Um, right now, we're set to watch the 2019 Ukrainian elections, where we think we're going to get a good feel for how Russia might have changed the, the model that they used, uh, how Russia may have may utilize technology that wasn't available three years ago or a year ago. And, and we think they're going to go after the Ukraine as aggressively as they have anybody. It's important that you know that this was not a model designed to come after America. This was a model that Russia created to domestically control the population in Russia. And when they saw how successful it was, all they did was export it, and they used it in the Netherlands, they used it in Montenegro, they used it in France, they used it in the United States. Um, they're back in uh, Montenegro now, trying to use it again. And uh, they do it for relatively zero money. And most of, these, uh, most of these efforts are carried out by Russian oligarchs who need no instruction, permission, or funding from the Russian government. So I, 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 I'm anxious to sit down with, the, with Bob Mueller at some point because it is impossible to find any connection back to um, the Kremlin or specifically to Putin because their, their structure of, of relationship between oligarchs and the, the government just isn't set up that way. Hmm. So in 2012, Democratic leaders, including President Obama, mocked Mitt Romney for calling Russia our biggest geopolitical foe. And that prompted a recent apology from former uh, Secretary of State Albright. And so I'm really curious, um, would you say that Russia is our biggest geopolitical foe right now? <laughs> Depends on what day it is. Um, Russia is a huge concern. On any given day, North Korea might be in front of that. On any given day, Iran might be in front of that. Any given day, China might be in front of that. But from a standpoint of a relentless effort, uh, Russia certainly deploys all the tools that they've got against the United States to to. really affect the discourse in this country. And, you know, I just have to ask you to go back to 2016 for a second. Um, there were a number of things that I can highlight that the Russians did, but the, the, the thing that sticks out most in my mind is that they ran a rally for Black Lives Matter and white supremacists on the same day, same time, at the same location. And you, you, the only thing the public saw was the news coverage of this confrontation between two groups. Russia didn't create the gap between Black Lives Matter and white supremacy. They took the existing structure in the United States of differences that we had and they just highlighted them. So they didn't make anything up. They used the differences we have societally in this country and they magnified them to where the media saw this as a newsworthy story. And you've got to understand that it was not just Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google. It was the use of RT and Sputnik, German broadcast outlets that reinforce this message that then made it legitimate for American broadcasters to carry the story in the same way. So can we talk a little bit about um, the domestic security threat posed by white nationalism? So, I mean, is this threat growing? 
Well, I think it is growing. I think it's growing because of uh, things like what Russia has done. Um, listen, we, we, we have always had our divisions in this country. But we managed those differences in a dialogue that never reached the pitch that we saw in Charlottesville, as an example. Um, today's communication capability means that between um, traditional broadcast and social media, you can drive these wedges to where the issues become volcanic almost. And there's nobody who has the responsibility to intercede in between those issues and calm it down. It is really the individuals that um, uh, have to have leadership that, that pulls the reins back. And that doesn't happen as often as it should. So I guess one more question on intelligence for the moment. Um, so what looming security risks may be ones that we're not really recognizing and paying close attention to at the moment? Would you say that you'd expect to dominate our national psyche, say, in the next, the next, fifth, next five years or so? Cybersecurity is going to be at the top of the list. It's one, two, three, four, all the way to ten. Um, the challenge is that technology is a wonderful tool. It, 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 it advances our businesses, it advances our lives, we get to communicate seamlessly, and the fact is that it makes us vulnerable to anybody who wants to exploit the portals that exist in that communications network. So Congress, the administration, and the industry is focused right now on the deployment of 5G technology. 5G replaces 4G in, in mobile communications. I see some heads going like this and other heads going, what's he talking about? Um, and trust me, the, the, a 63-year-old member of the United States Senate is not the one that you want talking about 5G, but I've had to learn it from the ground level up. 5G will be what everything that we purchase starting tomorrow transmits and runs across because it's got a chip in it. So we've got to make sure that we've got this interstate highway called 5G that is secure. And now we've got to back up and think about all those devices that we buy, everything from a clock radio to the security system that you use in the house. How about the refrigerator you just bought? The refrigerator that when it, something happens to it, you're going to call the service company, and the service company is going to say, will you hold your mobile phone up to the speaker once you've opened the door and hit this series of buttons, and the refrigerator is going to tell the service person what's wrong with it. That's going to run over the 5G highway. And it's already got an intelligent chip sitting in your kitchen. And there's probably one in every room of your house in some device that you've bought. And the question is, should those chips, should they be able to be secure? Or is it all about price? And now we've got to go back and sort of re-engineer everything that's going to the consumer market. And what role does the federal government have at mandating? Because I don't. Um, that, that wouldn't hold up in the Supreme Court for me to mandate something like that. But it could be that we set that as a standard for government purchases, and all of a sudden manufacturers say, if I've got to build it this way for the government, I'll build it that way all the time. And we get, a, we get a programmable chip in that that allows us to dial it in based upon what the threat is. Let me assure you, we're going to be dealing with cybersecurity, whether it's in your business or whether it's in your home, every day for the next 10 years. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So in addition to your work on the Intelligence Committee, you also serve on the Senate Health Committee, um, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on President Trump's 2020 budget proposal. And so you know, it includes a number of cuts for various programs uh, and programs and agencies, including the NIH and the NSF. 
Um, and so for a state like North Carolina that benefits from nearly $1.8 billion of research funding every year, wondering what this could mean for us. So I'm on my fourth president. Um, I've had this issue with every president's budget uh, where they want to cut something. Uh, typically they're cutting NIH, typically they're cutting something in education that everybody's excited about. Um, so my, my initial comment is, don't worry. It's a president's budget. Congress pays no attention to president's budgets. And it's just as true with Trump as it was with Obama, as it was for Bush, as it was for Clinton. Um, over the period of time that two administrations have now proposed cuts to the NIH, Congress has actually doubled the funding to the National Institute of Health. And a majority of the additional money has gone to extramural grants, meaning grants on research benches like Duke, Quake Forest, Chapel Hill. So uh, we really have invested in the future. Is it the right amount? You could probably make a case that with what China's currently spending in STEM, that we're not spending enough, or what China's spending in AI, that we're not spending enough. But we tend to look at things in isolation where they don't have a private sector that invests in these things. They do it all in government. We just don't do a good job of the coordination between federal grants and the collaboration with the private sector. We've got to get better at that. The, the collaborative model of the future is to have government employees, academia, and business all at the same research table, all working on the same projects. To some degree, that's still going to be a majority of the federal money financing that project. But in many cases where we have tried this model, we find that the private sector brings, in some cases, finances to the table, intellectual property to the table. And um, by, ha by actually placing federal employees in an academic setting, not for a day, not for a week, but on a permanent status, it changes the way collaboration works between academia and uh, the government. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the type of thing that we've got to understand better because we've got to stimulate that exchange. Mm -hmm. So a moment ago, you mentioned China and you mentioned STEM. And so I'm, I'm really curious. So recently, the Trump administration has pushed for visa restrictions on Chinese students citing intellectual property concerns. And a recent article in the New York Times mentioned that you've met with leaders of universities um, in North Carolina, including Duke and UNC, to warn them that the number of Chinese students is likely to decline. Could you talk a little bit about your concerns in that area? It's, it's you know, my observation, but as chairman of the Intelligence Committee, um, I, I try to display what our founders thought Congress should be, and that's a visionary body. One where we looked around the corner, not, not just reacted to what was going on, and I think we've become a very crisis management institution oriented. Um, so this is one where I'm trying to look down the road and say that if we can't find a solution um, to intellectual property theft, to data uh, theft, a number of things that uh, really are under the direction of the Chinese government, um, then we've got to be begin to limit our exposure to it. Mm -hmm. So I was actually out before the administration uh, meeting with presidents and chancellors and saying, I think there's a likelihood that we're going to reduce the number of education visas for Chinese students because of the, the risk that is apparent to us. Um, we're now there, and the administration's talking about it. Nothing's been implemented. I still believe that um, a scaling back of those visas is appropriate given the degree of risk that we're under. Um, but we're desperately trying to engage academia and government so that we can make a, if, if there is a different solution, we can come up with it. But understand what that means. It means that if we, if we want to try to include business at the table, then we've got to read CEOs in from an intelligence standpoint for a day so we can brief them on how serious the problem is. Mm -hmm. With college presidents and chancellors 
we start this month with the first briefings. President Duke will get a briefing along with his colleagues by the FBI, by the Intelligence uh, Committee, um, um, by the NSA, all at one time, a four-hour brief where we, we have declassified examples of it so that people can leave and go home and process it, not in a hypothetical way, in a real way. We're not there to scare anybody. We're there to try to get everybody on the same page because at some point we have to talk about what the solutions are. In the absence of having that dialogue, then the only solution is you drastically cut back the access of education visas. Mm. So one more question about education. So here at Duke, we really value the liberal arts and creativity. So I'm wondering, can you tell us about a time, maybe recently or maybe a little further back, when you had the opportunity to be creative? <laughs> I got married, does that count? Jeez, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting me at the end of a little over two years of living, uh, sleeping, eating uh, a Russia investigation. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, if you want to do something legislatively today, you've got to be creative. And I, I, I don't want to take everybody through 101 government real quick, but let me do it. The United States Senate is an interesting institution by design. I know every time I get ready to introduce a bill that it's going to require 60 votes, period. To get legislation passed in the United States Senate, it requires 60 votes. So tomorrow, if I introduce a bill, I know, without question, I need seven Democrats if I get all 53 Republicans, and getting 53 Republicans is not an easy thing. So I better err on the side of getting more Democrats. It's, it's a different starting point. The Senate, by design, begs bipartisanship. And... Um, the House is set up totally different. It's 50 plus one. Whoever has the one controls everything. They decide the rules, they decide what goes on the floor, and every vote can be the plus one, and, and it wins. Um, Senator Helms used to say that the Senate is the saucer for coffee. You pour the coffee in the saucer so it'll cool a little bit before you drink it. And... Um, the house is more taking the coffee right out of the cup and burning yourself. So I won't tell you that the institution has operated like it's designed. Some people forget. They utilize the 60 vote threshold to be the one that keeps something from happening versus helps something to happen. But when the institution was functioning as it's designed. It meant that no member ever got 100%, but 80% was a pretty good win because you had to bring along a bipartisan coalition of folks. And I, th I think that's still the way that the institution functions the best, and I, th I think we will return to that um, at some point in the distant, not too distant future. So on bipartisanship, so your committee has gained praise for being particularly bipartisan. And I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about how you, know, how you maintain this? To what do you attribute this fact? Well, let me just say that it's, it's foundational in the committee. Um, I've chaired now for four years. I, think. Um, I will not move anything on a party line vote. Period. If it's not a bipartisan vote, I won't vote it out of committee. And uh, it's because intelligence does not have a political leaning. So um, we interpret what we think uh, our role should be. And let me just state for you, the intelligence committee is usually one you never read about. It's never in the press. They never do interviews. Uh, at some point after this is over, I've got to put this genie back in the bottle and get members to recognize the fact that they don't go on stages or on camera and talk about what goes on in the Intelligence Committee. But we are, we're responsible for the oversight of 17 intelligence agencies. It's our job to make sure they live within the letter of the law and to certify that for 85 other members of the United States Senate that are not privy to the information we see. 
and to you, the American people, uh, that we have been an honest broker at looking at what our intelligence agencies do, and either the law allowed them to do it or an executive order allowed them to do it, and that we've signed off on it. So it's imperative that we have unanimity most of the time, uh, but at least overwhelming bipartisan support uh, on most of the initiatives that we uh, undertake. Again, we never report a vote out of the committee. So there's never a vote that's tied to a person. And seldom do we ever put a vote total out um, just simply because it's, it's more about how we choose to run it than how we choose to sell it. So, Senator, you voted to support President Trump's declaration of a national emergency at the border of Mexico. And so can you tell us a little bit about your views on the declaration itself and the need for a wall at the border? Sure. The first thing I did was sit down with my legal counsel, and I asked her to look at the issue and tell me whether the president had the authority to issue an emergency declaration. And she came back uh, literally the next day and she said, based upon the law that Congress passed, and I'm blank on the, the what was, 1975, 1975, um, the president has the authority to do this and therefore it is constitutional. So the two, the two things I had to determine in my mind was, is it legal and is it constitutional? From a standpoint of uh, the assessment by my legal counsel, those two things were yes. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I agree with the president's choice to declare a state of emergency because when it's been used in the past, it's because there was bipartisan support. And that's why 30 executive declarations are still currently in law. They're currently enforced today because they emerged out of bipartisanship. Um, I, to some degree, I think that maybe the president's been vindicated in the last week when you begin to see people like former Secretary Jay Johnson, head of Department of Homeland Security, come out and say, there is a, there is a crisis at the border. Um, so you can't look at the numbers of people who are attempting to cross and the challenges that we have from a standpoint of either detention or medical needs at the border and say there's not a crisis. There is a huge crisis. It's bigger than anything I've seen in the 25 years I have served. But it doesn't address what I think most Americans want. And that's, they want us to fix our legal immigration process. Mm -hmm. They want us to write it in a way that one, people understand it, and two, it's affordable for people to come here. I don't know how many of you know this, but if you're a, if you're a student in, in um, Africa and you want to come to the United States to go to Duke and you apply for an education visa, you've got a, you've got a fee that you've got to pay for, for your visa. And I can assure you, when you go through reading to fill out the visa, you're going to have questions. And when you call the embassy to ask a question, it's automatically going to switch you to a third-party vendor, and they're going to answer your question, and they're going to bill you $50 on your credit card. Well, ask yourself, how many kids can afford to initiate the visa, and then how many times can they pay $50 for the questions that they're going to have? We make it impossible for people who want to come here legally to do it cost-effectively and understandably. So if we fix that piece of it, the rest of it will begin to sort itself out, and I think we'll have a clearer picture of those places that we need to make changes in immigration policy that may extend outside of the legal process itself. But we can't seem to get that first initial step, which is do it. And um, we, we do that with a tragedy at our borders. I tend to look at things through the eyes of my intelligence committee, and it does present a national threat to us, but it presents a threat to us from a standpoint of health care because we've got diseases coming in the country that we have basically gotten rid of in the United States, um, and this gives us a reemergence of those. Um, it gives us challenges as it relates to the family unit. I mean, 
I'm sure everybody here hadn't had the pleasure of having grandchildren yet, but trust me, it's the greatest thing that can happen in the world. It's God's gift for not killing our children, if that makes any sense. I can't imagine, I can't imagine sending a child or a grandchild, grandchild on their own to another country to, to hopefully enter illegally. I, it, it's just beyond, but it happens every day over and over and over again because that's what they're counseling people to do to find the easy access for the family unit to come here. It's a, it's a perverse incentive that we have out there. So I'm curious about um, your, your views of the Green New Deal, similarly. So you've been critical of the Democrats' Green New Deal initiative, and you've called it unworkable, unachievable, and unaffordable. Can you talk a little bit about why the Senate declined to take up that resolution? Well, we voted on it. Oh, we just did. voted not to take it up. <laughs> um, I, I, listen, personally, I'd love to have a debate on it tomorrow. Um, and I don't remember describing it those three ways, but I could probably add some more things to it as well, and that's with the limited amount of information that there is on the Green New Deal. Um, you know, I put my track record at trying to be a steward for our environment and, and for our treasures up against anybody's. Uh, I fought for 25 years, and finally, um, earlier this year, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is a permanent fixture in America, period, end of sentence. Doesn't cost the American taxpayer a dime. It's off the royalties, and we're going to project. We're going to protect treasures that we have in North Carolina and every state across the country. And nobody has to worry about whether Congress reauthorizes it again. It is permanent. It's here. I can leave this earth, and I know that my grandchildren are going to benefit from that. But I've always said about the environment, I'm willing to push as far as technology allow it. Let us to allow us to go. But I don't want to set a goal that technology can't get to. And um, the Green New Deal is, is, to me, without looking at the specifics, it's a pipe dream. I mean, it is, it is a policy statement. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a legislative uh, document. And um, when you look back at even things like the Kyoto Protocol, uh, things that the United States were not signatories to, that's all process. Let's look at outcome for a second. The United States has cut emissions over the past 20 years faster than any country in the world. But we get no credit for that because we're the largest economy in the world. So we've actually been great stewards of reducing emissions. It's just we haven't done it the way some people wanted us to. And we've tried to do it conscious of the fact that to have a great environment with no economy is not necessarily something that some of us in Washington can aspire to. Uh, we believe that the American people should have employment, opportunity, and that can coexist with good stewards of the environment. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of bipartisanship, are there any parts of the Green New Deal that you can get behind? Well, again, there are not enough specifics out on the Green New Deal to make that assessment, but I've never found a piece of legislation that didn't have some value in it. And you know, as I said, I was, I was not a big fan of the Affordable Care Act. But the Affordable Care Act, thank goodness, has made pre-existing conditions of front and center in the health care debate, and pre-existing conditions should not be a disqualifier for anybody in health care, period. So I, 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 I think that was a good thing. There were probably five things that I pointed out in the Affordable Care Act that I would keep around if I were to get rid of it, but that's also... Uh, a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So recently, Americans have been paying a lot of attention to public safety and gun rights, uh, particularly after recent shootings in mosques in New Zealand and also suicides of people directly connected to victims of the Sandy Hook shooting and shooting um, at Stoneman Douglas, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. And so the Trump administration announced an initiative to ban bump stocks. 
for guns. And some, some have acknowledged this as a really nice first step. Others have said that it's really low-hanging fruit. And so I'm curious about your thoughts on the ban on bump, bump stocks. I was, I was supportive of the bump stock ban. Um, I don't think that there's any need in, in the current system that we have for, for bump stocks to be legal, mm -hmm. number one. Uh, I think what's different in the United States from a lot of countries, some of them referenced, uh, is that we do have a Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. And it's a right to bear arms. And it can be interpreted by people differently. Um, but at the end of the day, this is why you have a, um, the ultimate arbitrator, which is the Supreme Court. And it has taken on uh, cases. The most memorable of recent time was the DC ban on, on guns. And the Supreme Court, not in its current configuration, in the configuration before, which was not necessarily as favorable to the Second Amendment, said that D.C. overstepped uh, the legal bounds to, to ban firearms from D.C. Now, they were banned for about nine months, but that didn't stop any of the violent crimes. It didn't stop any of the murders. It's something that happens every day in Washington, D.C., and it's sad that you could have a nation's capital that's like that. It's not a necessarily about the accessibility of guns. It is about um, our inability to handle the people who have, one, um, mental illness, two, people who are, are, are habitual criminals. And um, I, I was delighted that we, had to do, that we had the opportunity to do criminal justice reform where we can knock down the sentence of people who are less likely to be repeat offenders but they got caught doing something bad and they, they, they had to pay the price and um, necessarily the, the federal guidelines were too excessive. And uh, they're gonna get out and we can focus on trying to incarcerate the habitual criminals. And if they never leave jail, so be it. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your thoughts on guns that are produced by 3D printers. Mm -hmm. So you know these might go undetected by metal detectors, and so thinking about like public safety, do you think that there should be special restrictions on those? As tough as it is for the chairman of the intelligence committee that would like everything to be detectable, um, that's not how the Second Amendment's written. And um, just like I said when we uh, when we started the Russian investigation. When I first contacted Facebook and Twitter, um, I didn't get a favorable response. And by continuing to dialogue with them and continuing to point out where the problem was to them, even though they're protected by the First Amendment, eventually they came around to a relationship that has been very fruitful from a standpoint of stopping many of the things that were going on. They've done it without breaching their First Amendment protection. I think engaging with individuals that um, might manufacture these domestically is a good thing, and maybe they'd see where it's in societal's benefit not to do it. But here again, I have to remind everybody here, the world is borderless now. And um, we, we don't just capture domestically the technology that it takes to create a 3D gun. It can be produced in any country in the world. And because it's hard to detect, it can be taken practically anywhere in the world. So um, we may feel good, but it's not going to change the, the threat in the future. And uh, uh, I can tell you that I fight this about continually as it relates to aviation safety and the fear that we're going to have an undetectable bomb uh, on an aircraft that's going to bring it down. And as my staff knows, even though we had two 737 Maxes that went down, one uh, Lion Air and the other one Ethiopian Air, um, my first reaction is I pick up the phone and I call the intelligence community to find out if we suspect that there was uh, anything on board that, uh, because that's something perpetually that we're concerned with. So, Senator, what would you say was the most difficult vote of your career? Uh, 
Well, I, I would tell you I haven't had a difficult vote. Um, you know, I had the best advice the first time I ran and I lost. And I remember going in to see somebody and I was sure they were going to write me a check and, you know, that, that, that's absolutely essential to win an election. And the guy looked at me and he said, uh, I'm not going to give you any money, but I'll give you some advice. He said, tell people what you believe and you'll never wonder what you said. Now, I took the advice and I used it. And when I decided uh, two years later to run, I never had to stop and think about what I said in that election. And I've never had to stop and think about a vote that I took because it was what I thought was right. I'm not going to tell you there's not been a vote that two years or later, I've turned around and said, you know, I was wrong. Um, but there have been none that were tough because I believed I was making the right vote. Um, my, my time is limited there. Maybe I will have one of those, and if I do, I'll call you back and tell you about it. <laughs> but if you ask it a different way, are there ones that are memorable and ones that are not? Yeah. Um, my staff has a requirement when they want me to work on legislation. And that requirement is they have to show me the human face behind the issue. You have to come in and display to me who's impacted by this. It is impossible to be passionate about something that you don't know how it affects somebody. But when you can zero in on who it is and you can see that face, then you become passionate about it. I, I knew who the beneficiaries were of Permanent Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's my grandchildren and your grandchildren. Uh, when I tried to create a, the ABLE Act, it's a 529 account for families with disabled children. It's because I spent time with the disabled children of these families. And I saw how the system that we had just was totally insufficient to allow a parent to leave this earth and believe that their child was going to be taken care of when they couldn't take care of themselves. And so there are things that I've done over the 25 years that don't affect a lot of people, but that I'm going to leave the United States Senate feeling a, a, a lot better because that's in place. And um, that's pretty much how I've, I've driven my time in Washington. You alluded to in the introduction that I was vice chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. I never will forget in 1995, I was this brand new member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and the chairman came up to me. His name was Tom Bliley. He was a Southern Republican from Richmond, Virginia, true gentleman. And he said, uh, Richard, I want you to reform the Food and Drug Administration. Gosh, I was a new member of Congress. This was, I mean, th he gave me like the plum job. And I can remember talking to some of my Republican colleagues, and I said, you're not going to believe this. Tom Bliley asked me to reform the FDA. And they looked at me and said, you idiot, it's way too big for you to reform it. Well, in 1997, we passed the FDA Modernization Act, the first time the FDA had been reformed since the 1930s when it was created. And I had to do it with my partner on the Democrat side of the House of Representatives, Henry Waxman, who wanted nothing more in life than to give the FDA jurisdiction over tobacco. Remember this, Larry? And Henry and I had to make a deal at the beginning of it. What was on the table and off the table. And I lost some things that went off the table, and he lost some things that went off the table. But I accomplished something that people told me couldn't be done. So when I had some of the school newspaper folks upstairs, they asked me some questions about entitlements and about debt and all of this. And my response to them is, everything can be done if you're willing to be persistent enough. But in the case of the FDA Modernization Act, it took me two and a half years. It took me from one Congress to another Congress. It, ta it takes a heck of a lot to keep your attention and your passion at that level. And if you're not looking at the people behind the issues, it is impossible. I apologize for my long answer. That's great. Thank you.
So in just a moment, we'd like to turn to the audience to open it up for some questions, but I have just two quick ones. And so audience members, please do be thinking about your questions, and if you have one, please raise your hand, and then our mic runners will make their way to you. Um, but I have to say, so you announced in 2016 that you plan to retire from politics in 2022. And I wonder, when you do so, and you ride off into the sunset, will it be in a 1974 VW thing? It probably will, because I can't find anybody who wants to buy it. <laughs> um, no, it's, a, it's become a, a, a legend on Capitol Hill. Um, I haven't driven it in about three months, and... Um, it's mainly because I can't stand riding in the snow and the cold weather quite as much as I used to. Um, but I've been asked so many times in the last two weeks where the thing was that next week it's coming out and it'll stay out for the summer, I can assure you. Very nice. Yeah. So they call it the weirdest car in all of Congress. How do you feel about that? Um, I'd rather be heckled than ignored. <laughs> So my final question. Um, so here at Sanford, we're thinking a lot about the pathway into politics and how to encourage young people to think of politics as a vocation. And it's really difficult because a lot of young people are really turned off to politics right now. And so, you know, we have over 500,000 elected positions to fill in the United States. And so I'm just wondering, do you have any advice that you would share with young people, including the students here tonight, about uh, why they might consider a career in public service. Well, I'd, I'd probably use the comment that George Bush Sr., the old guy, used in uh, 1988 when he gave his inaugural address. And he looked at the country and he said this, we're not the sum of our possessions. They're not the measure of our lives. In our hearts, we know what matters. We cannot hope only to leave our children a bigger car or a bigger bank account. We must hope to give them a sense of what it means to be a loyal friend, a loving parent, a citizen who leaves his home, his neighborhood, and his town better than he found it. So, Bush, like many, uh, believed that this was about what you gave back, not what you took. And it was a reminder to all of us, regardless of age, that we, we owe our communities, our country, our state, um, something and we determine how we're going to do that. De Tocqueville left the United States, and he said the United States was the greatest country in the world. And when he was asked to define that, he said, I'm paraphrasing, the Americans have the capacity to give of their time and their resources to help anybody in need. Now, I will tell you that De Tocqueville was 100% right. The part that we forget sometimes is that this is not passed in our DNA from parent to child. It's not like these healthcare things that are genetic. It is passed from parent to child by the example that our children see us do. Parents, teachers, coaches. So we have got to be better examples for the current generation that's coming up. Um, and it is it is tough for me to structure that into an academic course, except to say that we have to teach to the next generation that given is as important as taken. And you've got to find a place to plug that in. I never will forget that uh, this was probably 10 years ago, I'm trying to think of the age of my children now. And when I would come in from Washington, the first thing I would do was call my oldest son. And so he, he was out of school, he was working. I'd call him, especially if I got in early, I'd say, hey, let's get together because your mother doesn't know I'm here and she's got a dinner and you and I can go to dinner. And I never will forget this day, I called him and he said, I can't. I went, well, you can't? <laughs> what do you mean you can't? He said, well, I got a board meeting. I said, you're 24 years old. What board could you be on? He said, I'm on the Habitat for Humanity board. I went, really? You on any other boards? He said, yeah, three. And I left. I hung that phone up, and I went, yeah. It took. And, and you know, it's that sense of satisfaction that you set the right example, that they, they, they learned from it, and they acted on it. And now it's his responsibility to the next generation. Very nice. Thank you. All right, so questions from the audience. Hi, Senator. 
there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so you mentioned a couple times the importance of cooperation between the federal government and companies such as Facebook and Twitter. And I was just wondering, as these companies have more and more international interests, more and more um, international people are coming to work at them, the temptation of the Chinese economy and consumer base becomes more attractive. How do you work with these companies to ensure that they're keeping American national interest in mind when they're shaping policy? Boy, great question. Really, really tough. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I said to Facebook. Um, you, don't, you don't need us, but we need you. But at some point, if you're if Congress ends up legislating on social media, the way your model is constructed, you'll be out of business. And I recognize the fact that they've got privacy um, provisions that they've got to extend to their customers. And I, I haven't asked for a backdoor to anything. I haven't asked for them to breach privacy. All I've asked for them to do is to collaborate. So. Um, I'm real curious to watch Mark Zuckerberg, who in the last week has said the government should regulate us more. I want to see what he means by that. Um, this, this is strange. It doesn't fit. Um, because you either have a platform that's free to communicate on, or if you're not going to do that, then you've got to be a Netflix or an Amazon Prime, where you charge $9.95 a month. And, and that's the way you, you create a revenue stream. And I think what we were able to do was we were able to form a relationship that allowed their business to continue in its current architecture, not affecting their revenue stream, and both sides benefiting from that collaboration. So I, 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 one, it worked. Two, I think this is helpful and we need to learn from it because we're gonna run into it as technology spins at the pace that it is. And let me just say, I probably should have said this earlier. Um, when you asked about the things that keep me up at night, it's the architecture of government. We don't have the capacity in this country the way we're designed for an innovator on a research bench at Duke or for somebody in their garage to create something and commercialize it tomorrow because of all the different sign-offs that have to happen. That doesn't happen in China. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It happens here because we've got so many layers of bureaucracy you've got to go through. And um, if we don't learn that we've got to be as fast as they are at deployment of technology, then we're going to be way behind before it's over with. So I want to encourage those companies to stay here. I want them to have global businesses, but I want to do everything I can to keep the nucleus of, of that R&D here. Thank you um, so much for coming, Senator. Thank you for your service uh, to the state of North Carolina. Um, I am a public school teacher. I teach uh, social studies to high schoolers in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and first, I was wondering um, if you were aware of the May 1st Day of Advocacy planned by a group of educators here in North Carolina. Uh, I'm aware that there is one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have um, five things that we're fighting for. Um, we would like for an increase uh, in the number of librarians, psychologists, social workers, counselors, and nurses to meet national standards, um, a $15 minimum wage for all school personnel, and a 5% raise for teachers. Uh, we would like for the expansion of Medicaid uh, to better protect our students and their families. Uh, we would like to reinstate uh, the state retiree health benefits that were cut by the General Assembly in 2017. And we would like to restore advanced degree comp compensation, which was cut by the General Assembly in 2013. Um, and so these are mainly things that we are asking of our state legislature, because they are generally what's in charge of them. But I was wondering if you had a response to these demands um, from a federal perspective. Well, let me just say this. Federal government is less than 10% funder of K through 12 education. Uh, we, we, we do structure um, uh, some federal policy on K through 12. Uh, we did a reauthorization of K through 12, I think two years ago, but I'm old, my memory's a little bad. Uh, at that time, we took uh, 
Uh, we left Title I alone. We took 63 pots of money that were available for K through 12 schools around the country, and we merged them all into one because I heard teachers and principals say, you know, if you're doing a, a federal grant program, but we don't run that program, then we'd lose out on an opportunity to get the money. So I orchestrated melding that all into one pot and basically said, if you, if, if you use any money to increase the education of the kids in the classroom, then it qualifies for entry into this pot of money. You're lobbying the right people. It's a state. I have no jurisdiction over any of it. I will say that just on a personal note, the one thing that was not in the list of items that you brought up was educating the kids in the classroom. A lot of it was about teachers and workers and this and that. And I really do, I, I, I'm really concerned about what we're doing to educate the kids. That's where I want to put the money, personally. They're sort of picking with the mic, so I'll let them do it. Uh, Senator, I'd like to take you back uh, to Russia for, for uh, just a moment. Uh, certainly the, the, the Brits have a mess on their hands with Brexit. Do you have any reason to believe that the Russians have been involved uh, in, in seeking to pit uh, the Brits against each other? Yes, sir. For over a long period of time, particularly to Duke and higher ed. Um, prior to 9-11, uh, there was um, a sense that our intelligence agencies were pretty siloed and were not communicating as effectively as they might, and a lot of things have been done since then. I'm curious as to your sense of have we, if not eliminated, have we minimized to the degree we can those silos and have the kind of communication we need? And then if that's the case, given the fact that these agencies have been pretty uniform and consistent in identifying a number of these national threats, what are the consequences of having a president who sort of dismisses that uh, going forward? Well, I'll take it as a two-part, okay? Um, first part, um, we have exhaustively gone through and broken down these silos and the collaboration between all 17 um, intelligence agencies is seamless today. And if it wasn't seamless, you couldn't pull off what we did in 2018 where you've got even a new entry since 9-11, which is the Department of Homeland Security. And because of its size, is a challenge to, to let anybody play in the sandbox they're in. But it works, and it works successfully. Um, and I, I might say lives within the letter of the law or the executive order. So I, I, I'm very confident that they can do their job and do it very effectively. Um, as I've shared with the president, it is not helpful to take members of the intelligence community and to question the product that they deliver to you. The, without exception, they deliver the product that they see um, in the work that they do. You can, ha you can disagree from a policy standpoint with the recommendation that their information shares with you, but you can't tell them that their information is wrong. Uh, I'm being very selective saying what I the president and I talked about. Um, I will say this, that his response was extremely good. And uh, uh, he had some different conversations uh, after that with the heads of those agencies. But I think that the, the, the president has been under attack since he took office on intelligent products. And it's been the meat of the Mueller investigation. To some degree, it's been the meat of my investigation. So I can understand his distaste. But it's important from a policy standpoint that he accept without condition their assessments and make a decision on what policies he's going to adopt with or without that assessment being uh, validating what he's doing. 
he has that authority because he's commander in chief. Well, first of all, thank you for actually being here. It's nice to see you in person instead of watching you on Channel 9 News. Um, so obviously you represent the great state of North Carolina, which I am proud of to be a citizen of, but you also represent the United States. And so sometimes it may seem difficult to balance what your constituency wants with what's best for the country. So I was just wondering, how do you do that? And how do you kind of, you know, represent the people, but also try to show them, you know, maybe what they want isn't always what's best? Well, I, th I, th I think it's... I mean, it's, it's ingrained in how I've run my office for 25 years. And that's that we, we hear from both sides of an issue. And I make an assessment from that. Um, everybody has to be given the opportunity to tell me that I'm wrong. And we try to do that. Now, uh, rarely am I moved, but I have been moved because of, of something somebody shared with me. And as I admitted earlier, I, I've gotten uh, passed a vote a month, a year, and I've looked back on it and said, you know, I got that one wrong. Uh, I just made a wrong assessment. So I, I think it's an important part of the process, but I try to show the courtesy to the people that I represent that what they think or what they do, it matters. And we try to convey that back in the service that we provide them. Um, this is not something we go out and herald, but um, my office does more capital tours than any member of the United States Senate or House of Representatives on Capitol Hill. We also run more people through the Capitol Guide Service than any other office on Capitol Hill. It's not because we enjoy giving capital tours, though we do. Um, it's, I think that's one of the functions that we're supposed to provide. And we have a lot of people take us up on it. Uh, I treat every school group that comes up there, everybody in that group, I consider this to be the only visit they're ever going to make in Washington. Now, I know some of them are going to come back as adults, but if it is the only visit, I want to make sure they hear the full, everything we can give them in that one visit. I can't do that unless I've got control of them. So that's why we do so many of the tours. And I just think we're, we're, we're a lot more hands-on than a lot of offices. Um, dear Senator, I just wanted to make a point. Um, I was hoping you could look into H.R. 4282 to amend the Food and Drug Administration Act that a food product should not be declared a drug just because it claims to cure, pre prevent, or treat a disease. Um, I tried to invent an herbal product, and I've been stuck in this regulatory maze for two years. Uh, it's H.R. 4282, Ron Paul brought it up in 2005, 2006, that a food product shouldn't be considered a drug simply because it claims to treat, prevent, or cure a disease. That's Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. It wouldn't surprise me if I found out that the statute, as written, actually doesn't allow them to do that. Um, but I, but I'd, I'd have to research it because the FDA has followed very few of the statutes I wrote into law in 1997. That's, that's a pretty tough thing to admit to, but, they, but they, they have a very tough time doing it. Senator uh, Steve Rao, I'm a senior member of the city council in the town of Morrisville. And I uh, just want to follow, first of all, thank you for everything you do. You also have a wonderful staff member in Betty Jo Shepherd. She represents you so well across the state. Um, I wanted to um, follow up on your discussion of innovation and address the connection between legal immigration and innovation. Because in this region, we have thousands and thousands of Asian Americans, Indian Americans that are on skilled immigration visas. And over the years, one of my top constituent requests, even in the town, has been, I've been here 10 years, 12 years, I can't get my citizenship. So my question is, how do we accelerate the path to those legal immigrants that are here on H-1Bs, reducing caps on the green cards, making it easier for them to be here because my concern is that they're leaving to go to other countries. And I just wanted to see how do you put it all together into one package, you think? Uh, we... um, difficult, difficult, because I don't consider in that, in that primary package that H-1B, H-1A is part of that. You, you, that that's sort of an addendum to uh, the legal immigration um, system. And um, we're working aggressively to try to make sure that the caps are 
that they're flexible, um, that we're, we're trying to use them to attract the talents that we need in America, and that they're not all absorbed because they, it is a limited number every year. They're not absorbed into one sector of our economy at the detriment of, of somewhere where we needed them more. Um, we will always be challenged in this country to find the talent that we need until we invest in growing it at home. So, so I'm very sympathetic of a K through 12 question. I'm very sympathetic of, of uh, uh, the President of Duke and the conversation we had today. But at some point, we've got to grow the talent we need at home. And that means we've got to challenge our students at a different level. We have to change our expectations of what they can accomplish. And um, if there's a way for us to create federal incentives that allow us to generate that type of passion on the part of the students, then I'm willing to do it because I think it's the right investment to make. You might remember we had a million nurse shortage about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, we did some things to um, create an incentive for people to go into nursing. And institutions then turned around and doubled the size of their nursing class. And in like three years, we closed the gap on this million nurses. We can do it. We've just got to find the right mix of what we need to put together. And um, the American people are incredibly talented. And we continue to be the land of innovation. But it is very difficult to today um, to profit on a timely basis from that innovation. It's much more profitable to sell your technology into the marketplace. And that's why I respect some of these innovators that uh, their first impulse is not to go public. It's to build a, a good private sector business where you value employees and you value the product that you, that you created. We've got time for one more over here? I think we have time here? for just one more. One more, right. He's had, well, two oh. of them have had their hand up. I think we have a mic runner who has someone right up oh. there. Senator. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so you talked a lot today about how you think the internet and access to the internet are going to really shape the future of society. And I know you're also a huge supporter of the First Amendment. So I'm curious about how those two views of yours mesh to uh, produce your view on net neutrality. <laughs> um. I think you can be supportive of the explosion that technology is going through. And you can do that as a, not only a protector of the First Amendment, um, you can do it by, it, 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 even while you support policies that don't open it up quite as openly as what I think some would like it to, because I, th I think there's still, sector by sector, uh, there needs to be controls. And um, telecom is, it, it is a tough one. Um, I never dreamed when I grew up, I never dreamed 10 years ago, that technology would spin as fast as it is. If, if Tim Cook thought he could sell you three iPhones a year, then he would introduce three new iPhones a year. Um, but, but he knows that the most he can do is two. Um, the, car that you're, the car that you're driving probably has the ability to do a lot of other things. They just haven't turned it on yet because they want to wait for the model change before they, they turn that on. But the technology's in there. To think that we're talking about autonomous vehicles um, and that people are talking about autonomous uh, airplanes, I'm going to tell you, I'll get in the back of a car autonomous, but I don't think I'm getting in a plane that's not, I didn't got a pilot up. Uh, these are things that, when I grew up, they were in comic books. 
and they were things you dreamed about. And now my wife has a watch that looks just like the Dick Tracy watch that uh, I, I grew up looking at where she talks in it. And, you know, I still remember that my dad, bless his heart, died at 91, about six years ago. And uh, I looked at him a few days before he passed away, and I said, Dad, is there any regrets you have? And he said, yeah, I'm going to die and never figure out how a fax machine worked. <laughs> so, so I asked some of you, especially the ones up there, um, we have generational differences. And I try to recognize why people from a different generation think differently than I do, and I try to take that into account. But I can't accept it all of the time because some of it's so foundational to me. And um, so you, you asked earlier, what's the tough one? The tough one's when I get to that. And um, there are just some things that um, you're not going to convince me of at 63 years old and having lived the majority of my life uh, the way I have. By the other standpoint, though, there's some things I've surprised people because the argument and the education that people have given me has been compelling. And um, if, if an elected official uses their mouth more than they do their ears, then you've found somebody that's not worthy of the position you put them in. Because listening is more important than talking. Thank you, Senator. Thank Senator Rivera, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us for the Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture. Hope you have a great evening.